Alexandra was a farm originally named for the wife of a white man who owned it, like Sophia Town and other black spots populating white areas before apartheid. Alex started out as a squatter settlement where blacks gathered and lived when coming to Johannesburg to find work. What was unique about Alex is that this farmer sold plots of land to some of the black tenants in the time before it was illegal for blacks to own the property. So while while Sophia Town and other black ghettos were raised and rebuilt as white suburbs, Alex fought and held on and asserted its right to exist. Wealthy white suburbs like San Santon grew around it, but Alex remained. When democracy came, people flooded into Alex from the homelands, building new shacks in the backyards of other shacks, with still more shacks attached to the backside of those shacks, growing more dense and more compressed leaving close to 200,000 people living in a few square kilometers. Even if you go back today, Alex hasn't changed. It can't change. It's physically impossible for it to change. It can only be what it is. Chapter 15, The Cheese Boys. My friend Bangani was a short, bald, super buff guy. He wasn't always that way. His whole life he'd been skinny, and then a bodybuilding magazine found its way into his hands and changed his life. Bangani was one of those people who brought the best out in everybody. He was that friend who believed in you and saw the potential in you that nobody else did, which was why so many of the township kids gravitated toward him, and why I gravitated toward him as well. Bangani was always popular, but his reputation really took off when he beat up one of the most infamous bullies in the school. That cemented his status as a sort of leader and protector of the township kids. Bongani lived in Alex, but I never visited him there while we were still in school. He'd always come to my house in the Highlands North. I'd been to Alex a few times for brief visits, but I'd never spend any real time there. I'd never been there at night. Let's put it that way. Going to Alex during the day is different from going there at night. The place was nicknamed Gamora for a reason. One day after school, not long before we matriculated, Bongani walked up to me on the quad. Hey, let's go to the hood, he said. The hood? At first, I had no idea what he was talking about. I knew the word hood from rap songs, and I knew the different townships where black people lived, but I never used the one to describe the other. The walls of apartheid were coming down, and just as American hip-hop was blowing up, and hip-hop made it cool to be from the hood. Before, living in a township was something to be ashamed of. It was the bottom of the bottom, then we had movies like Boys in the Hood and Menace to Society, and they made the hood look cool. The characters in those movies, in the songs, they owned it. Kids in the township started doing the same, wearing their identity as a badge of honor. You were no longer from the township, you are from the hood. Being from Alex gave you way more street cred than living in Highlands North. So when Bangani said, let's go to the hood, I was curious about what he meant. When Bongani took me to Alex, we entered as most people do, from the Santon side. You ride through one of the richest neighborhoods in Johannesburg, past palatial mansions and huge money. Then you go through the industrial belt of Winburg that corns off the rich and white from the poor and black. At the entrance to Alex, there's a huge minibus rank and the bus station. It's the same bustling, chaotic third world marketplace you see in James Bond and Jason Bourne movies. Everything's dynamic. Everything's in motion. Nothing feels like it was there yesterday, and nothing feels like it will be there tomorrow. But every day it looks exactly the same. Right next to the minibus rank, of course, is a KFC. That's one thing about South Africa. There's always a KFC. KFC found the black people. KFC did not play games. They were in the hood before McDonald's, before Burger King, before anyone. KFC was like, yo, we're here for you. Once you go past the minibus rank, mini rank, you're in Alex proper. It's a hive of human activity. All day long, people coming and going. Gangsters hustling, guys on the corner doing nothing, kids running around. There's nowhere for all that energy to go. No mechanism for it to dissipate. So it erupts periodically in epic acts of violence and crazy parties. One minute it'll be a placid afternoon, people hanging out, doing their thing, and the next thing you know, there's a cop chasing gangsters, flying through the streets, a gun battle going off, 
helicopter circling overhead, then ten minutes later, it's like it never happened. Alex is laid out on a grid, a series of avenues. The streets are paved, but the sidewalks are mostly dirt. The color scheme is cinder block and corrugated iron, gray and dark gray, punctuated by bright splashes of color. Someone's painted a wall lime green, and there's a bright red sign above a takeaway shop. Or maybe somebody's picked up a bright blue piece of sheet metal just by luck. There's little in the way of basic sanitation. Trash is everywhere. Typically a garbage fire is going down some side street. There's always something burning in the hood. As you walk, there's every smell you can imagine. People are cooking, eating takeaway in the streets. Some family has a shack that's jerry-built onto the back of someone else's shack. They don't have any running water, so they've bathed in a bucket from the outdoor tap and then dumped the dirty water in the street where it runs into the river of sewage that's already there because the water system has backed up again. There's a guy fixing cars who thinks he knows what he's doing, but he doesn't. He's dumping old motor oil into the street, and now the oil is combining with the dirty bath water to make a ri river of filth running down the street. There's probably a goat hanging around. There's always a goat. As you're walking, sound washes over you, the steady thrum of human activity, people talking in a dozen different languages, chatting, haggling, arguing. There's music playing constantly. You've got traditional South African music coming from one corner, someone blasting Dolly Parton from the next corner, and someone driving past pumping Notorious B.I.G. The hood was a complete sensory overload for me. But within the chaos, there was order, a system, a social hierarchy based on where you lived. First Avenue was not cool at all because it was right next to the commotion of the minibus rank. Second Avenue was nice because it had semi-houses that were built when there was still a sort of formal settlement going on. Third, Fourth, and Fifth Avenue were nicer for the township. These were established families, the old money. From Sixth Avenue on down, it was more shacks and shanties. There were some schools, a few soccer fields. There were a couple of hostels, giant projects built by the government for housing migrant workers. You never wanted to go there. That's where the serious gangsters were. After 20th Avenue, you hit the Jukesky River, and on the far side of that, across the Roosevelt Street Bridge, was East Bank, the newest, nicest part of the hood. East Bank was where the government had gone in, cleared out the squatters and their shacks, and started building actual homes. It was still low-income housing, but decent two-bedroom houses with tiny yards. The families who lived there had a bit of money and usually sent their kids out of the hood to better schools, like Sandringham. Bongani's parents lived in East Bank. At the corner of Roosevelt and Springbok Crescent, and after walking from the minibus rank through the hood, we wound up there. Hanging around outside his house on the low brick wall down the middle of Springbok Crescent, doing nothing, shooting the breeze. I didn't know it then, but I was about to spend the next three years of my life hanging out at that very spot. I graduated from high school when I was 17, and by that point, my, my, that point life at home had become toxic because of my stepfather. I didn't want to be there anymore. My mom agreed that I should move out. She helped me move to a cheap, roach-infested flat in a building down the road. My plan in so far, as I had one, was to go to university to be a computer programmer. But we couldn't afford the tuition. I needed to make money. The only way I knew how to make money was selling pirated CDs. And one of the best places to sell CDs was in the hood, because that's where the minibus rank was. Minibus drivers were always looking for new songs, because having good music was something they used to attract customers. Another nice thing about the hood is that it's super cheap. You can get by on next to nothing. You can get a meal called a coda. It's a quarter loaf of bread. You scrape the bread, you scrape out the bread, and then you fill it with fried potatoes, a slice of bologna, and some pickled mango relish called achar. That costs a couple of rand. If you have a bit more money, you can throw in a hot dog. If you have still a bit more, you can throw in a proper sausage, like a bratwurst, or maybe a fried egg. The biggest kota, with all the upgrades, is enough to feed three people. For us, the ultimate upgrade was to throw on a slice of cheese. Cheese was always the thing. 
because it was so expensive. Cheese on anything was money. If you got a burger, that was cool. But if you got a cheeseburger, that meant you had more money than the guy who had just had a hamburger. Cheese on a sandwich, cheese in your fridge, that meant you were living the good life. In any township in Africa, if you had a bit of money, people would say, Oh, you're a cheese boy. In essence, you're not really hood because your family has enough money to buy cheese. And Alex, because Bangani and his crew lived in East Bank, they were considered cheese boys. Ironically, because they lived on the first street just over the river, they were looked down on as the scruff on East Bank, and the kids in the nicer houses higher up in East Bank were the cheesier cheese boys. Bangani and his crew would never admit to being cheese boys. They would insist, we're not cheese, we're hood. But then the real hood guys would say, eh, you're not hood, you're cheese. We're not cheese, Bangani's guys would say, pointing further up the bank. Their cheese. It was all a bunch of ridiculous posturing about who was hood and who was cheese. Bangani was the leader of his crew, the guy who everyone got together and got things moving. Then there was Imzi, Bangani's henchman, small guy just wanted to tag along, be in the mix. Becky was the drinks man, always finding us booze and always coming up with an excuse to drink. Then there was Katkotze, we called him G, Mr. Nice Guy. All G was interested in was women. If women were in the mix, he was in the gang. And finally, there was Hitler, the life of the party. Hitler just wanted to dance. Cheese boys were in a uniquely messed up situation when apartheid ended. It is one thing to be born in the hood and know that you'll never leave the hood. But the cheese boy has been shown the world outside. His family has done okay. They have a house. They've sent him to a decent school. Maybe he's even matriculated. He has been given more potential, but he has not been given more opportunity. He has been aware, given an awareness of the world that is out there, but he has not been given the means to reach it. The unemployment rate, technically speaking, was lower in South Africa during apartheid, which makes sense. There was slavery. That's how everyone was employed. When democracy came, everyone had to be paid a minimum wage. The cost of labor went up and suddenly millions of people were out of work. The unemployment rate for young black men post-apartheid shot up, sometimes as high as 50%. What, what happens to a lot of guys is they finish high school, and they can't afford university, and even little retail jobs can be hard to come by when you're from the hood and you look and talk a certain way. So, for many young men in South Africa's townships, freedom looked like this. Every morning, they wake up, Maybe their parents go to work, or maybe not, and they go outside and chill in the corner the whole day. They're free. They've been taught how to fish, but no one will give them a fishing rod. One of the first things I learned in the hood is that there's a very fine line between civilian and criminal. We like to believe we live in a world of good guys and bad guys, and in the suburbs it's easy to believe that, because getting to know a career criminal in the suburbs is a difficult thing. But then you go to the hood and you see there are so many shades in between. In the hood, even if you're not a hardcore criminal, crime is in your life in some way or another. There are degrees of it. It's everyone from the mom buying some food that fell off the back of a truck to feed her family, all the way up to gangs selling military grade weapons and hardware. The hood made me realize that crime succeeds because crime does one thing the government doesn't do. Crime cares. Crime is grassroots. Crime looks for young kids who need support and a lifting hand. Crime offers internship programs and summer jobs and opportunities for advancement. Crime gets involved in the community. Crime doesn't discriminate. My life of crime started off small, selling pirated CDs on the corner. That in itself was a crime, and today I feel like I owe all those artists money for stealing their music. But by hood standards, it doesn't qualify as illegal. At the time, it never occurred to any of us that we were doing anything wrong. If copying CDs is wrong, why do they make CD writers? The garage of Bangani's house opened up onto Springbok Crescent. Every morning, we'd open the doors, run an extension cord out into the street, set up a table, and play music. People would walk by and ask, What is that? Can I get one, please? Our corner was also where a lot of minibus drivers ended their routes. 
and turned around to loop back to the minibus rank. It swing by, place an order, come back, pick it up. Swing by, place an order, come back, pick it up. We spent our whole day running out to them, going back to the garage and making more mixes, and going back out to sell. There was a converted shipping container around the corner where we'd hang out when we got tired of the wall. It had a payphone installed inside it, and we'd use it to call people. When things were slow, we'd wander back and forth between the container and the wall, talking and hanging out with other people with nothing to do in the middle of the day. We talked to drug dealers, talked to gangsters. Every now and then, the cops would come crashing through, a day in the life in the hood. Next day, same thing. Selling slowly evolved into hustling because Bangani saw all the angles and knew how to exploit them. Like Tom, Bangani was a hustler, but where Tom was only about the short con, Bangani had schemes. If we do this, if we get that, then we can flip that for that other thing, which gives us the leverage we need for something bigger. Some minibus drivers couldn't pay up front, for example. I don't have the money because I just started my shift, they'd say, but I need new music. Can I owe you guys some form of credit? I'll owe you a ride. I'll pay you at the end of my shift, at the end of the week. So we started letting drivers buy on credit, charging them a bit of interest. We started making more money, never more than a few hundred, maybe a thousand rand at a time. But it was all cash on hand. Bangani was quick to realize the position we were in. Cash is the one thing that everyone in the hood needs. Everyone's looking for a short-term loan for something, to pay a bill, to pay a fine, just hold things together. People started coming to us and asking for money. Bangani would cut a deal, and then he'd come to me. Yo, we're going to make a deal with this guy. We're going to loan him 100 and he's going to give us back 120 at the end of the week. I'd say, okay. We started to double our money and triple our money. Cash gave us leverage in the hood's barter economy as well. It's common knowledge that if you're standing on a corner of a main street in the hood, somebody's going to try and sell you something. That's the hood. Someone's always buying Someone's always selling, and the hustle is about trying to be in the middle of the whole thing. None of it was legal. Nobody knew where anything came from, and you don't ask. It's just, hey, look what I found. Cool, how much do you want? That's the international code. At first, I didn't know not to ask. I remember one time we bought a car stereo or something like that. But who did it belong to? I said, hey, don't worry about it, one of the guys told me. White people have insurance. Insurance? Yeah, when white people lose stuff, they have insurance policies that pay them cash for what they lost. So it's like they lost nothing. Oh, okay, I said. Sounds nice. And that was as far as we ever got thought about it. When white people lose their stuff, they get money. Just another perk of being white. It's easy to be judgmental about crime when you live in a world wealthy enough to be removed from it. But the hood taught me that everyone has different notions of right and wrong, different definitions of what constitutes crime and what level of crime they're willing to participate in. My own mother, my super religious law-abiding mother, who used to rant at me about breaking rules and learning to behave, came home one day with a giant box of frozen burger patties, like 200 of them, from a takeaway place called Black Steer. A burger at Black Steer cost at least 20 rand. What is all this? I said. Oh, some guy at work was selling them, she said. We got a great discount. But where did he get them from? I don't know. He said he knew somebody who... Mommy stole them. We don't know that. We do know that. Where is some guy going to get all these burger patties from? Randomly. Of course we ate the burgers, then we thanked God for the meal. Every day in the hood was the same. I'd wake up early, Bangani would meet me at my flat, and we'd catch a minibus to Alex with my computer carrying the whole giant tower and the giant heavy monitor the whole way. We'd set it up in Bangani's garage and start the first batch of CDs. Then we'd walk. We'd go down to the corner of 19th and Roosevelt for breakfast. When you're trying to stretch your money, food is where you have to be careful. You have to plan or you'll eat your profits. So every morning for breakfast, we ate vetkoek, which is fried dough. Basically, those were cheap, like 50 cents a pop. We 
could buy a lunch of those and have enough energy to sustain us until later in the day. Then we'd sit on the corner and eat. While we ate, we'd be picking up orders from the minibus drivers as they went past. After that, we'd go back to Bangani's garage, listen to music, lift weights, make CDs. Around 10 or 11, the drivers would start coming back from their morning routes. We'd take the CDs and head out to the corner for them to pick up their stuff. Then we'd just be on the corner, hanging out, meeting characters, seeing who came by, seeing where the day was going to take us. A guy needs this. A guy selling that. We never know what it was going to be. There was always a big rush of business at lunch. We'd be all over Alexandra, hitting up different shops and corners, making deals with everyone. We'd hop on the minibuses and use it as an opportunity to talk to the drivers about what music they needed. But secretly, we were riding the guys for free. Hey, we want to collect orders. We'll talk to you for a while while you drive. What do you need? What music are you looking for? Do you need the new Maxwell? Okay, we got the new Maxwell. Okay, we'll talk to you later. We'll jump out here. Then we'd hop on another ride, going wherever we needed to go next. After lunch, business would die down. And that's when we'd get our lunch. Usually the cheapest thing we could afford like a smiley or some maize meal. A smiley is a goat's head. They're boiled and covered with chili pepper. We call them smileys because when you're done eating all the meat off it, the goat looks like it's smiling at you from the plate. The cheeks and the tongue are quite delicious, but the eyes are disgusting. They pop in your mouth. You put the eyeball in your mouth and you bite it. And it's just a ball of pus that pops. There's no crunch. It has no chew has no flavor that is appetizing in any way. After lunch, we'd head back to the garage, relax, sleep off the meal, and make more CDs. In the afternoons, we'd see a lot of moms. Moms loved us. They were some of our best customers. Since moms run the household, they're the ones looking to buy that box of soap that fall off the back of the truck. And they were more likely to buy it from us because we were upstanding well-spoken East Bank boys. We could even charge a premium because we added a layer of respectability to the transaction. Moms are also often the most uh, in need of short-term loans to pay for this or that for the family. Again, they'd rather deal with us than with some gangster loan shark. Mom knew we weren't going to break anyone's legs if we, they couldn't pay. We didn't believe in that. Also, we weren't capable of it. Let's not forget that part. At the peak of our operation, we probably ran around 10,000 Rand in capital. We had loans going out and interest coming in. We had our stockpile of Jordans and DVD players we would bought to resell. We also had to buy blank CDs, hire minibuses to go to our DJ gigs, feed five guys three times a day. We'd keep track of everything on the computer. Having lived in my mom's world, I knew how to do spreadsheets. We had a Microsoft Excel document laid out everybody's name, how much they owed, when they paid, when they didn't pay. Once the after work rush started to taper off, we'd wind down. We'd make our last collections, go over our CD stock, balance our accounts. If there was a party to DJ that night, we'd start getting ready for that. Otherwise, we'd buy a few beers and sit around and drink, talk about the day, listen to the gunshots in the distance. Gunshots went off every night. We'd always try to guess what kind of gun it was. Usually there'd be a police chase, cop cars flying through after some guy in a stolen car. Then everyone would go home for dinner with their families. I'd take my computer, get back on a minibus, ride home, sleep, then come back and do it all over again the next day. A year passed. Then two. I'd stopped planning for school and there was, and was no closer to having the money to enroll. The tricky thing about the hood is that you're always working. Working, 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 and you feel like something's happening. But really, nothing's happening at all. I was out there every day from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And every day it was, how do we turn 10 rand into 20? How do we turn 20 into 50? How do I turn 50 into 100? There were many days where we'd end up back at zero. But I always felt like I'd been very productive. Hustling is to work what surfing the internet is to reading. If you add up... How much you read in a year on the internet, tweets, Facebook posts, lists, you've read the equivalent of a ton of books. But in fact, you've read no books in a year. 
When I look back at it, that's how hustling was. It's maximal effort put into minimal gain. It's a hamster wheel. If I put all that energy into studying, I'd have earned an MBA. Instead, I was majoring in hustling, something no university would give me a degree for. When I first went to Alex, I was drawn by the electricity and the excitement of it. But more important, I was accepted there, more so than I'd been in high school or anywhere else. When I first showed up, a couple of people raised an eyebrow. Who's this colored kid? But the hood doesn't judge. If you want to be there, you can be there. Because I didn't live in the hood, I was technically an outsider. But for the first time in my life, I didn't feel like one. The hood was also low stress, comfortable life. All your mental energy goes into getting by, so you don't have to ask yourself any of the big questions. Who am I? Who am I supposed to be? Am I doing enough? You never feel like a failure in the hood, because someone's always worse off than you. And you don't feel like you need to do more, because the biggest success isn't that much higher than you, either. It allows you to exist in a state of suspended animation. The hood was strangely comforting, but comfort can be dangerous. Comfort provides a floor, but also a ceiling. In our crew, our friend G was like the rest of us, unemployed, hanging out. Then he got a job at a nice clothing store. Every morning he went to work, and the guys would tease him about it. We'd see him headed out all dressed up, and everyone would be laughing at him. Oh, gee, look at you in your fancy clothes. Oh, gee, going to see the white man today, huh? Oh, gee, don't forget to bring some books back from the library. One morning, after a month of G working at the place, we were hanging out on the wall, and G came out in his slippers and socks. He wasn't dressed for work. Yo, G, what's going on? What's up with the job? Oh, I don't work there anymore. Why? They accused me of stealing something, and I got fired. And I'll never forget thinking that it felt like he did it on purpose. He sabotaged himself so that he could get accepted back in the group again. The hood has a gravitational pull. It never leaves you behind, but it also never lets you leave. Because by making the choice to leave, you're insulting the place that raised you and made you and never turned you away. And that place fights you back. As soon as things start going well for you in the hood, it's time to go. Because the hood will drag you back in. It will find a way. There will be a guy who steals a thing and puts it in your car and the cops find it. Something. You can't stay. You think you can. You'll start doing better and you'll bring your hood friends out to a nice club. And next thing you know, somebody starts a fight and one of your friends pulls a gun. And somebody's getting shot. And you're left standing around going, what's what just happened? The hood happened. One night I was DJing a party right outside Alex in Lombardi East, a nicer middle class black neighborhood. The police were calling about the noise. They came busting in wearing riot gear, pointing machine guns, what Americans call SWAT. It's just our regular police. They came looking for the source of music, and the music was coming from me. This one cop came over to where I was with my computer and pulled a massive assault rifle on me. You gotta shut this thing down now. Okay, okay, I said, I'm shutting it down. But I was running Windows 95. Windows 95 took forever to shut down. I was closing windows, shutting down programs. I had one of those fat Seagate drives that damaged easily, and I didn't want to cut the power and possibly damage the drive. This cop clearly didn't care about any of that. Shut it down, shut it down. I am. I'm shutting it down. I have to close the programs. The crowd was getting angry and the cop was getting nervous. He turned his gun away from me and shot and shot the computer. Only he clearly didn't know anything about computers because he shot the monitor. The monitor exploded but the music kept playing. Now there was chaos. Music blaring and everyone running and panicking because of the gunshot. I yanked the power cord out of the tower to shut the thing down. Then the cops started firing tear, tear gas into the crowd. The tear gas had nothing to do with me or the music. Tear gas is just what the police used to shut down parties in black neighborhoods. Like a club turning on the lights and telling everyone to go home. I lost the hard drive. Even though the cops shot the monitor, the explosion somehow fired the thing. The computer would still boot up, but I couldn't read the drive. My music library was gone. Even if I had the money for a new hard drive, it had taken me years to amass the music collection. There was no way to replace it. The DJing business was over. The CD selling business was done. All of a 
a sudden our crew lost its main revenue stream. After we had left the hustle, we we hustled even harder, taking a bit of cash we had on hand and trying to double it, buying this to flip for that. We started eating into our savings, and in less than a month, we were running on dust. Then one evening after work, this one dude, who looked like a black version of Mr. Burns from The Simpsons, and who worked at the airport, came by. Hey, look what I found, he said. What do you've got? A camera. It was stuff he was boosting from people's luggage. I'll never forget that camera. It was a digital camera. We bought it from him, and I took it and turned it on. It was full of pictures of a nice white family on vacation, and I felt awful. The other things we bought had never mattered to me. Nikes, electric toothbrushes, electric razors. Who cares? Yeah, some guy might get fired because of the pallet of cornflakes that went missing from the supermarket. But that's degrees removed. You don't think about it. But this camera had a face. I went through those pictures, knowing how much my family pictures meant to me, and I thought, I haven't stolen a camera. I've stolen someone's memories. I've stolen part of someone's life. It's a strange thing, but in two years of hustling, I never once thought of it as a crime. I honestly didn't think it was bad. In society, we do horrible things to one another because we don't see the person it affects. We don't see their face. We don't see them as people, which is the whole reason the hood was built in the first place, to keep the victims of apartheid out of sight and out of mind. Because if white people ever saw black people as human, they would see that slavery is unconscionable. We live in a world where we don't see the ramifications of what we do to others, because we don't live with them. If we could see one another's pain and empathize with one another, it would never be worth it to us to commit the crimes in the first place. As much as we needed the money, I never sold the camera. I felt too guilty. It would be bad karma. The camera made me confront the fact that there were people on the other end of this thing I was doing. And what I was doing was wrong. One night our crew got invited to a dance in Soweto against another crew. Hitler was going to compete with the best dancer, Hector, who was one of the best dancers in South Africa at the time. This invitation was a huge deal. We were going over there, repping our hood. Alex and Soweto have always had a huge rivalry. Soweto was, was seen as the snobbish township, and Alexandra was seen as the gritty, dirty township. Hector was from Dipe Loof, which was nice, well-off part of Soweto. Dipe Kloof was where the first million rand houses were built after democracy. Hey, we're not a township anymore. We're building nice things now. That was the attitude. That's who we're up against. Hitler practiced for a whole week. We took a minibus over to Dyke Kloof the night of the dance. Me, Bangani, Mezzi, Becky, and G, and Hitler. Hector won the competition. Then G was caught kissing one of their girls, and it turned into a fight, and everything broke down. On our way back to Alex, around one in the morning, as we were pulling out of Dyke Kloof on the way home, some cops pulled over our minibus. They made everyone get out, and they searched it. We were standing outside, lined up alongside the car, when one of the cops came back. We found a gun, he said. Whose gun is it? We all shrugged. We don't know, we said. Nope, somebody knows. It's somebody's gun. Officer, we really don't know, Bangani said. The cops slapped Bangani hard across the face. You're messing with me. Then he went down the line, slapping each of us across the face, berating us about the gun. We couldn't do anything but stand there and take it. You guys are trash, the cops said. Where are you from? Alex. Oh, okay, I see. Dogs from Alex. You come here and you rob people and you hijack cars? Bunch of worthless hoodlums? No, we're dancers. We don't know. I don't care. You're all going to jail until we figure out whose gun this is. At a certain point, we realized the cop was shaking us down for a bribe. Spot fine is the euphemism everyone uses. You go through this elaborate dance with the cop where you say the thing without saying the thing. Can't we do something? You asked the officer. What do you want me to do? We're really sorry, officer. What can we do? You tell me. Then you're supposed to make up a story where you indicate to the cop how much money you have, which we couldn't do 
because we didn't have any money. So he took us to jail. It was a public bus. It could have been anyone's gun. But the guys from Alex were the only ones who got arrested. Everyone else on the minibus was free to go. The cops took us to the police station and threw us in a cell and pulled us out one by one for questioning. Then they pulled me aside. I had to get my home address. Highlands North. The cop gave me the most confused look. You're not from Alex? He said. What are you doing with these crooks? I didn't know what to say. He glared at me hard. Listen here, rich boy. You think it's fun running around with these guys? This isn't play play anymore. Just tell me the truth about your friends and the gun and I'll let you go. I told him no. He threw me back in the cell. We spent the night and the next day I called a friend who said he could borrow money from his dad to get us out. Later that day, the dad came and paid the money. The cops kept calling it bail, but it was a bribe. We were never formally arrested or processed. There was no paperwork. We got out and everything was fine, but it rattled us. Every day we were on the streets, hustling, trying to act as if we were in some way down with the gangs, but the truth was, we were always more cheese than hood. We created this idea of ourselves as a defense mechanism to survive in the world we were living in. Bangani and the other East Bank guys, because of where they were from, what they looked like, they had just very little hope. You've got two options in that situation. You take a retail job, flip burgers at McDonald's, if you're the lucky one who even gets that much. The other option is to toughen up, put up this facade, you can't leave the hood, so you survive by the rules of the hood. I chose to live in the world, but I wasn't from that world. I chose to live in that world, but I wasn't from that world. If anything, I was an imposter. Day to day, I was in it as much as everyone else. But the difference was, in the back of my mind, I knew I had other options. I could leave. They couldn't. 